Broken Windows by J. Nunn Parker, published in the Occult Digest, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1927. There it was, a broken window, and in a house full of persons, no one had heard the crash. I turned the particles of shattered glass about with the toe of my shoe and wondered why, why that window was broken now when a short two hours earlier it had been whole. The rambling old wreck of a house which I and several writers, artists, musicians, and their wives had taken for the month of August sprawled high on the edge of a precipitous cliff, high in the Ozarks, miles from a town of any size and deserted until we moved in to liven up the place and to rest. Humph, a lot of resting we did, but there was that broken window glaring at me with its jagged black eye. I cogitated and Duval, a painter, cogitated also. Well, he remarked presently, who done the do? Looks as if somebody done it with his little hatchet, I observed, peering into the basement room to which the mutilated window gave. It's too dark down there to see much. What did you expect to see? Ghosts, humph, Duval thumbed his nose at the aperture. To listen to you, one would think this old barn was tenanted by scads and scads of flying Dutchmen and men in iron masks and hoodlums of similar cognomens. I guess the wind blew out that window pane. That's all. And did it silently, I suppose, I finished caustically. But nevertheless, that was our first inkling that all was not right in the old house. Windows didn't go about breaking themselves noiselessly. We repaired to the library above where the other guests were amusing themselves at cards. One of them, Vaughn, was playing something oriental on his violin. His wife seemed to be amusing herself by making black and white pencil sketches of the gathering. Something to send to Henry, she explained to me as I entered. Henry operated the little cafe in the artist's quarter where most of us lived and worked. The chamber lay yellow in the flickering blaze of several wall sconces bearing tall wax candles, and the embers of a fire glowed in the great fireplace. That day had been chill, for summer. I seated myself in a huge armchair in a corner and watched with a casual eye the gaiety of the room. That queer odor of burning wax reached my nostrils, and I noticed that almost imperceptible movement of the curtains when the wind outside became wilder than usual. John, someone said. I jumped as if I had heard a pistol shot. Everyone laughed. Your nerves aren't so good, are they? Duval asked. Better have a toddy and go to bed. It's getting moved in, I tried to explain, but I knew that it was not exertion which had caused me to start, nor fatigue, but the fact that I felt something was not exactly right with our present habitation. I wasn't afraid, merely apprehensive. I was nervous. Whose portrait is that, I wonder? I demanded after the toddy Duval had suggested had been disposed of. I pointed to a painting which was hanging in the shadows of a niche in the wall. Oh, I had noticed that, someone answered. Good work, isn't it? What portrait, Duval demanded, always on the alert for art. I pointed to the niche. Hadn't noticed it, he remarked, and strolled over to get a better view, his hands thrust in his trousers pockets, a cigarette hanging from the corner of his mouth. He stopped before the painting. I watched him from the corner of my eye. I enjoyed listening to his sarcastic remarks relating to poor work and to temper his boundless praise of something which struck his fancy anything, I thought, to get off my mind this premonition of impending disaster. I saw Duval suddenly start, peer more closely at the painting, then turn, and without a word leave the room. His face was deathly white. I started to speak to him, but since nobody had seemed to notice the incident, I held my tongue and soon retired with Vaughn to the upstairs regions. I nodded good night to him and his wife and tried to sleep, but sleep would not come. Closing my eyes, I tried to count sheep jumping fences. My sheep would do nothing but balk and glare at me with eyes the size of saucers. I turned on my side to evade the glare of the sheep. No. The eyes grew larger and more horrible, finally filling the room with their huge white pupils. Then they would shrink to pinpoints and begin to grow until they again filled the chamber. Every tick of my watch broke the night into segments and every sound of the wind outside was magnified to terrible clatters. After what seemed to be hours of painful wakefulness, I heard a footstep in the hallway outside my door. This was not an imaginary step either, I assured myself, and slipped on my house shoes and picked up a pistol and a flashlight from the table at my bedside. Another step, someone was walking tiptoeing down the corridor. 
Then I heard the step upon the stairs. Waiting a safe interval, I opened my bedroom door as quietly as possible and followed, making no sound whatsoever. I had known from the first that there was a mystery inside those old walls. I stopped at the door of the library, a match scratched inside, and I saw the reflected glow of lighted candles. Someone was lighting candles at one o'clock in the morning. Who? I peered cautiously inside to see. Duval was standing before the portrait, staring, his lips moving silently. He stood there the better part of a quarter hour. Totally perplexed, I waited to see the thing through. I could not divine, through my wildest speculations, what new fancy had entered the excitable brain of my artist friend. Then, in the profound stillness, I became aware of a shape against a long, low window giving to the veranda. And before my bulging eyes, I saw the glass crumple silently and fall to the oaken floor, silently as if it were falling upon thick velvet. I felt the roots of my hair crawling upon my scalp. That explained, or rather clouded, the mystery of the broken cellar window. All in a sudden, before I could gather my wits, a girl, a striking blonde, stepped through the shattered window and stood for a brief moment in the direct flare of a blazing sconce. I had never seen her before. She wore a negligee, so far as I could judge, reached almost to the floor, hiding her slippers. The face was wistful, sad, and remarkably beautiful. She crossed the room and stood behind Duval, who, not seeing her enter, still was regarding the portrait. Suddenly, evidently catching her image from the corner of his eye, he whirled and confronted her. Not budging from where he stood, his complexion faded gradually until his face in the flickering candlelight became pallid, spectral, ghostly. You have come? He asked in a frightened voice. Yes, I have come for you, she replied in a low, sweet tremor. I am lonesome alone. Oh my God! Duval shrieked suddenly and threw himself at the visitor. You, you, let me alone. The figure backed away from him toward the window through which she had entered. Fear in the man seemed to give way suddenly to anger, and he followed her. Smiling slowly, she continued to back away from him. She stepped through the window. Duval followed, crouching now, his fingers clutching claw-like ahead from him. I am lonesome, she repeated, and turned and ran down the steps toward the cliff in front of the house. Duval tore after her, charging blindly into the night, shouting and swearing at the girlish shape just ahead of him. I followed. I shouted. The guests were awakened at Duval's screams and appeared at the library door in an excited group. Stop, stop, Duval, I shouted. The cliff, the cliff. Unheeding, the fool ran on, the girl barely escaping his hands by deftly twisting her body. The cliff, Duval. Too late. Both the man and the girl disappeared before my eyes over the black rim of the precipice. She seemed to smile at him before her face flashed from view. I heard a thud upon the rocks far below, and sick at heart, I returned to the house for lights and help. We found him, all right, a bleeding pulp, every bone in his body smashed, his fingers clutching nothing in blind fury. There was no trace of a girl. There was no sign that pointed to the fact that there had ever been a girl. The other persons in the house called me a fool, very bluntly, when I told them I had seen Duval follow someone off the edge of that cliff. Insanity, Vaughn whispered to me. He lost his mind, too much work, unbalanced hell of being an artist. I said nothing, but I knew I had not seen things the earlier part of the night. The day broke, cold and gray in the hills, and a fine mist filled the air. We sent the gardener's son for a mortician and sat about the great fireplace huddled talking in whispers. Luckily, Duval was not married. I should have pitied his wife on a day like that. It was bad enough as it was. Becoming exasperated with the demeanor of the others, I went outside to talk to the gardener. Anyone would be more pleasant company than the funeral crowd about the fireplace. Besides, my nerves were about shot after the happenings of the previous night. I found him sitting on the porch of a little outhouse, mending a hoe handle. Tall, spare, and gray, he perhaps was a bad choice if I were looking for someone to raise my dampened spirits. Nevertheless, I advanced slowly, spoke pleasantly, and inquired, well, Mr. Dune, you're about the only one who isn't in a panic about the death last night. He raised his non-colored eyes and looked keenly at me for an interval. Then he spoke. Are you jesting? No, I'm half crazy with it all. They think I've seen things and have placed me in the category of the bewitched. You saw something? 
I saw a girl lead Duval over the edge of that cliff, if that's anything. No girl was found on the rocks below. I know it. He dropped the unfinished hoe handle in a corner and motioned me to a chair. Sit down. I'll tell you a story. I sat down. I'm an old man. I was born on this place when it was a real manor, when the owner, Master Stevenson, owned Negroes, lots of them, and when his name carried power and wealth. He had a daughter, Marie. She killed herself. He paused, looking into the gray haze hovering about the mountaintops. Why? I ventured, wondering that he did not continue. Because a man, a stranger, betrayed her, ruined her. It killed her father. Who did it? When? I demanded. I don't know. Twenty years ago. He was an artist, traveling through these hills, painting. She loved him and he ruined her and left. Her grave is behind the hill. Want to see it? I shook my head. Later, I said, it's raining now. He nodded agreement. So it is, he said, raining. It rains a lot here, doesn't it? Too much for anyone's good sometimes. Wondering what he meant by that, I asked another question. This Marie, what did she look like? She was a lady. Her portrait is hanging in the library. The artist painted it and gave it to her. Old man Stevenson was on the point of slashing it with his knife again and again, but he didn't somehow. It was her portrait. Further questions brought no replies. The old gardener refused to answer them and probably regretting that he had told me as much as he had about the history of the Stevenson family skeleton, he went inside the house, leaving me alone on the porch. I returned to the house, wondering, the fireplace circle looked up as I entered. There was a suspicious silence about the group, which told me more plainly than words that they had been discussing in my absence, my extraordinary vision the night before. Somehow, I knew that they were wondering why I had managed to be present at the exact time Duval had jumped over a cliff. But I did not bother to talk to them. I wanted to see the portrait of Marie Stevenson. I wanted to see the signature of the artist who painted that portrait and I stepped before the shadowy niche where it hung, struck a match, and peered at the lower right-hand corner. Almost illegible in the cracked paint, I made out the letters D-U-V-A-L, 190 row. So that was why Duval was interested in the painting. That was the reason he had paled when he looked at it the night before. The night before. His death. Feeling a queer sensation in the region of my spine, I glanced at the face of the painting. The match held flaringly high above my head. A striking brunette smiled down at me, wistfully, sadly. Before me hung the portrait of the woman I had seen enter through the window, the girl whom Duval had followed over the cliff.